Many people are using the Faith by app to help provide the wisdom, community, and money management to stay on track, financially speaking. To date, over 37,000 members are using its digital envelope system, participating in our community forums, and engaging in virtual workshops. And one of the most convenient features is the ability to keep all your accounts in one place for an easy at a glance view. You can choose from one of three options depending on your management style, and it's available on desktop or mobile. Go to faithfy.com and click app to get started. So you want to save more, but don't think you make enough. But is earning more money really the answer? Hi, I'm Rob West. You might be surprised to hear that how much you save doesn't have much to do with your salary. And there's data to back that up. I'll talk about it today, and then it's on to your calls at 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. This is Faith and Finance, biblical wisdom for your financial decisions. Well, a study by the Employee Benefit Research Institute and J.P. Morgan sheds light on people's saving habits and why some folks are successful at it and others aren't. It defined three different levels of savers. Uh, What they called low savers managed to put away about 2 to 3% of their salary. The next category, middle savers, banked 5 to 6% of their income. And high savers were consistently saving about 9% of their salary. So middle savers put away about 3% more than low savers and high savers 3% more than middle savers. Now, those are savings rates, not income rates. In fact, they have nothing to do with income. The research showed clearly that people, often with identical incomes, saved at different rates and not necessarily more than folks earning less. Simply put, there's no link between income and saving. This helps explain why financial author Ron Blue describes as a consumptive lifestyle. That's when folks who earn more spend more. Instead of banking all or part of a raise, they tend to increase their lifestyle and spending. It may also explain why savings rates actually went up during the COVID shutdowns. As people saw their income reduced or even just threatened, they cut back on spending to save more. Of course, the Bible says we should do this all the time because we never know what the future may bring. In Proverbs 6, we find, Go to the ant, O sluggard, consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she provides her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. The message there is that saving isn't complicated. You just can't be lazy about it. It's easy to let your spending creep up as you earn more money. It takes discipline to prevent that from happening. If you've fallen victim to the consumptive lifestyle, try this. Pledge to bank any type of future increase you receive, whether it's a raise, a tax refund, or even a gift card. Go ahead and use the gift card on budgeted purchases, but move an equivalent amount into savings. And in the meantime, how do you move from being a low saver to a middle saver or middle to high saver? Well, the research showed that you can get the most bang for your buck by concentrating on three Three key areas. First, high savers tended to focus their saving efforts on housing. That includes a mortgage or rent, taxes, utilities, and home furnishing. Look for ways to save there. Second, see how you can cut spending on food, both eating out and groceries. And finally, trim the cost of transportation, which includes vehicle purchases, fuel, and maintenance. Constantly looking for ways to cut costs in those categories could move you into the next higher bracket of savers, and that 3% increase will have a huge impact over time. The research showed that retirement account balances of middle savers were twice as large as those of low savers. The researchers also posed this question to respondents. Would you rather save $150 a month, $35 a week, or $5 a day? Four times as many people chose to save $5 a day rather than $150 a month, even though it's the same amount. 
and that was consistent across the various income ranges. The bottom line is that psychologically, it seems easier to give up something that costs $5 a day. Keep that in mind when you're looking for ways to cut spending. It's helpful to write down every penny you spend for at least a month. Three would be better. As you do that, look for small repeat purchases that you can live without. You'll probably find that saving $5 a day is pretty easy. Just don't tell yourself that you're actually saving $150 a month. And if you need help with this, well, why not download the FaithFi app? It can help you set up your budget in three different ways, depending on your management style. It will also track your spending and alert you when you go over in a category. You can download it at FaithFi.com. That's FaithFi.com or wherever you get your apps. Increasing your savings, even by just a little, will make a big difference in the long run. We hope this helps you move up into a higher saving category. All right, your calls are next. 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. Much more straight ahead. Forty-five thousand. That's how many times Faith and Finance referred a listener to a certified kingdom advisor last year. And for good reason. These are trusted financial, legal, and accounting professionals who have completed a rigorous certification program to ensure biblically wise financial advice as part of their practice. You can find a local CKA professional in your area by going to faithfi.com and clicking on the Find a CKA button on the homepage. For 30 years, Sound Mind Investing has been helping Christians reach their financial goals with step-by-step guidance for investors at every stage, from those just getting started to those getting ready for retirement. Through scriptural principles and practical suggestions, SMI offers financial wisdom for living well. More information, including a short video webinar on profit and peace of mind, no matter what's happening in the market, is available at soundmindinvesting.org. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West, your host. We're going to take your calls and questions in just a moment. We've got some lines open, though, and we'd love to hear from you. So here's the number, 800-525-7000. That's 800-525-7000. Let's begin today in Parma, Ohio, WCRF. Hi, Ed. How can I help you, sir? Well, hi, Rob. Uh, Good to talk to you. A quick question. Uh, I've uh, got conflicting um, um, uh, opinions over years, and I just want if you can clarify. Is it better if one has credit cards that you really don't use? And let's say, for example, you've got like 10 cards and $150,000 of available credit, but you're really only using two or three of them for like 5 k Is it better to leave them open to, to establish a better credit rating because you're not using that much of your available credit? or to close them, and if you do close them, does that cause your credit rating to, to, to go down? You know what yeah. I'm saying? I do, absolutely, and it's a great question. Uh, you know, it will uh, result in your credit score declining, but likely it would just be temporary. Uh, let me ask you, Ed, are you carrying balances on the two or three cards you are using, or are you just charging and then paying it off? I'm charging them and paying them all off, to be honest okay. with you. When, when I yeah, get a great. bill, basically, I just, I just, you know, whatever the balance is, whether it's eight hundred, a thousand, two hundred. I've got American. Well, I've, I've, I've got a, a few, but what I do is I primarily use one American Express when I travel, one um, Mastercard because it's, it's, a, it's was issued by my Century Federal uh, Credit Union because I'm a federal employee, and then a Visa. So those are the three that I, that, that I really use, and the other ones I just got over. The years because, you know, you got a good deal. You know what I'm saying? That, that yeah, you oh, absolutely. It. Sure. Yeah, I, I like closing them just because it's not only going to re- remove the temptation to use it, although it doesn't sound like that's a real problem for you, but more importantly, it removes the potential for it to be compromised. So if one of those accounts is hacked and, uh, you know, there's charges on there and because you're not actively using these accounts, perhaps you're not monitoring them as closely because in most months the balance is zero with no activity, uh, then you might miss it. Uh, whereas if you close 
lose these, it's going to remove them uh, and, you know, take away the possibility that somebody could compromise these accounts and use them fraudulently. Now, why would the score drop? Well, uh, depending upon how old these accounts are, part of the FICO scoring formula is the length of credit, the history that you have. And if these are some older accounts, uh, obviously it's going to take that away. But if you've got a pretty long history of credit in general, that's probably not going to be an issue. The other issue would be that um, it would push your credit utilization percentage up because with less available credit, um, you know, any balances that you're carrying would be a higher percentage of the total. And, you know, that if it pushed over 30% could hurt you. The fact that you're charging and paying these off, even though the uh, statement balance is being reported to the bureau prior to you paying it off, it's probably, you know, much less than 30% of the total available credit, I would imagine. So that's likely not going to be an issue. The only thing you may want to think about is if you were about to go out and look for a new loan of some kind, you were in the market shopping for a car and you plan to borrow a portion of it, or you're looking to refinance your house or something like that, you'd probably not want to close it right then because a temporary decline, even of 60 or 90 days could potentially drop you into a lower tier that would result in higher interest expense and not as uh, favorable terms. But if you're not out seeking new credit, I would say let's start closing perhaps two accounts every six months until you get down to the number that is more manageable. Uh, any temporary decline would be just that. I think you'd see it come right back up and uh, we'll remove the possibility that these accounts could be compromised. Does that make sense? Yes, that makes perfect sense. And the ones that I would keep are my oldest accounts, and they're going back by 20 years, I think. So, perfect. Yeah, those are the ones yeah. I would keep. Well, so perfect, you're going to be perfect, in great perfect. shape, Ed. Thank you so we, much. You have a great you're day. You're welcome. God bless you, sir. We appreciate your calling. 800-525-7000. We've got some lines open. Is it credit or savings? Perhaps it's investing or giving. We'd love to hear from you. 800 800- Five two five seven thousand to Tampa, Florida. Uh, Barbara, I understand you have a question about an annuity. How can I help? Yes, uh, this is an, an annuity that uh, I bought ten years ago, and so now it's I, I, it's mature. I guess is the right term. Uh, it's time for me to decide whether I want to take an income stream from it or surrender it and reinvest it. My financial advisor says that if I do that, she would suggest putting that into a moderate, aggressive um, portfolio. Um, so I don't need that income stream, and to me it seems like such a small amount each year. It would be, the minimum would be uh, 8000 and something. Uh, this year uh, it would be 9600 Uh It kind of depends on the, how the market's doing, I think. Yes. So I've been all confused about it ever since I, <laughs> ever since I purchased it, and uh, I'm leaning toward uh, surrendering it. But I just wanted to get some some of your thoughts about that. Sure, I'd be happy to weigh in, Barbara. What is the amount that is uh, the surrender value on that? It's around one hundred and fifty-seven thousand. Okay, very good. And your income sources, other than Social Security, are what? Uh, my husband has a um, military retirement pension and a okay. VA pension. Okay. All right. And that's enough between the pension and the social security. Um, it's enough to cover your expenses. Yes, it is. Okay. And, um, I have quite a bit, I have a, around 500,000 in my, um, IRA. I see. Okay. And have you been happy with how that's been invested and performing? Yes, I have been. It's been, you know, staying pretty stable. Sure, sure. And do you have, how many months worth of expenses do you have in liquid savings? Uh, well, let's see, quite a few. I don't know. Okay. We have probably around 75000 uh, just okay. in, you know, an emergency fund. So. Perfect. Okay, that sounds great. Well, I, I like this idea. You know, I don't think given the assets that you've been able to accumulate, your modest lifestyle, the cash that you have in reserves, I don't see a need to continue with another insurance product unless you were just looking for those guarantees. But it sounds like you have a great relationship with an investment professional who understands what you're trying to accomplish. I think the key would just be making sure that you're not taking more risk than you're comfortable with because you 
you don't have to. You know, your expenses are covered. You've got quite a nest egg there. Yeah, you want to be a good steward of it and see it grow for your heirs, but we don't want to take unnecessary risk. And, you know, given what the market's done the last couple of years and the 10 years before that, we've had quite a run. And if we were to hit some speed bumps along the way, let's say we were to get into a, a recession a year or two from now, we'd come through it and move out of it and move higher. And the good news is you could let that money stay right there and recover. But I'd want to make sure that you're comfortable, you know, if in a quarter your portfolio was down 15 or 20 percent, you know, would that give you any uh, real concern? Would that cause you to lose some sleep? Or would you be comfortable saying, nope, I'm going to stay with the long term plan. It'll come back and I'll be just fine. You know, I want you to have those conversations with your advisor to make sure you're ready for that so that you don't uh, have risk that you're taking unnecessarily. But apart from that, I like the idea of you uh, perhaps rolling this out if it's qualified money into an IRA uh, or into a taxable account so that it could be managed in the way you described. And I think that's probably the best way to go. Okay. Okay. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, Barbara, thank you for calling. We appreciate you listening today. Folks, uh, we all want to be good stewards of God's money. The good news is the Bible is chock full of wisdom that's timeless and always right and always relevant. It's never going to change. And that's going to make sure that when we apply those principles, we'll put ourselves in a position to experience God's best. More of your calls just around the corner, 800-525-7000. Stay with us. Absolutely free. We know you've learned to be suspicious of those words, but really, you can get biblical financial wisdom delivered to your inbox absolutely free. Articles, videos, podcasts, and special offers on biblical resources. More than 50,000 people receive our free weekly wisdom email, and you can too. Create your free faith and finance account. Just visit faithfi.com and click sign up. We are grateful for support from Praxis Mutual Funds. Praxis Mutual Funds has seven impact strategies that are designed to create positive real-world change. More information is available at PraxisMutualFunds.com. The fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses are contained in the prospectus and summary prospectus. This and other information is available at PraxisMutualFunds.com. Investments involve risk. Principal loss is possible. Foreside Fund Services, LLC. Welcome back to Faith and Finance. I'm Rob West. Uh, This is the program where the 2300 verses on money and possessions found in God's Word intersect with today's financial decisions and choices. The number to get in on the conversation, 800-525-7000. 800-525-7000. On to New Mexico. Hi, Marcy. How can I help you? My question is, I work just on commission, so I try to tithe to my church when I have a sale. Um, New Mexico is the full-term abortion capital of the United States, and there are a lot of politics here that I just really think need to be changed. I would like to be able to contribute to um, conservative candidates who are very open about their faith, and I wonder if that... Considered as part of my tithe to encourage, you know, God's work yeah. in this state, or is that not appropriate? Yeah. Well, a couple of thoughts. I mean, let's back up and talk about the tithe for a second. I mean, clearly we see the tithe in the Old Testament, even before the law of Moses with Melchizedek and Abraham. And then clearly it was a part of the uh, Jewish law. And there was actually multiple tithes, but the word tithe means a tenth. And we see in Malachi bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, the temple, which would be most akin today to the local church. So I think if we're going to apply the principle of the tithe, even though we're now under the law of Christ. Uh, We don't want to be legalistic about it. We want to follow the pattern of the New Testament and give cheerfully and give generously, give proportionately as well, which I mean, which I believe means systematically. So I like the principle of the tithe in terms of a starting point for our giving. And because the word tithe means a tenth, that'd be a great place to start as well. And for me, I would put that toward the local church. 
and then I would absolutely encourage you to give beyond that to look for where God is working in your life and meeting the needs of others around your convictions. And obviously, God's given you a conviction to align your values around political candidates that are going to promote those values that are very important to you and you believe come right out of Scripture. And I would absolutely affirm the idea of you doing that. For me, I just wouldn't see it as a part of the tithe. But at the end of the day, your giving is between you and the Lord. I think you ought to just, you know, pray through that uh, and make a decision as to what are you going to give to support the local church? And then beyond that, where are you going to give where God has uh, really captured your heart and you believe aligns with what he's uh, doing in the world? And I can uh, absolutely affirm this idea of uh, supporting political candidates that line up with that. So hopefully that's helpful to you. I think at the end of the day, uh, just take this up with the Lord and uh, ask him how he would have you to proceed. And we appreciate your call today. We're going to head back to the phones today. We're going to stay in Illinois. Hi, Amy. How can I help you? Hi, Rob. Um, I just had a question. My husband, um, we have an opportunity through his work to purchase stock. Uh, they are opening it up to the employees. They're get, um, we're purchasing it at a lower cost than the actual, you know, rate it's going for at the time. Sure. And they're mm-hmm. guaranteed over three years that if they lose, like if it went down at all, that they won't lose any money in it, that they can only make gains in it. And mm-hmm. we were just wondering if that, I know that stock's doing really good right now, and it's that stock has been doing really good, if that would be a good option that we should get into. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sounds good to me. You know, stock options for you, from your employer are, are quite popular. They give you the right to buy a specific number of shares of your company's stock during a period of time. And as you said, at a price that your employee sets, the reason they do this is they want to attract and keep good workers. They want you to feel like an owner of the company. And uh, this is obviously a benefit. Um, they set the price uh, for the stock. Uh, it's usually discounted, um, you know, in some cases uh, below the market price at that time. And, you know, once you exercise it, in this case, it sounds like they're providing a guarantee, which is not typical and, um, you know, would provide that floor underneath what you're uh, doing. So I like that a lot. The only potential concern is just getting too highly concentrated in your company's stock. You know, I would prefer that you keep your total investable assets to 20% or less. But given the benefits that you're describing, the immediate uh, profit that you're going to realize by, you know, buying it at a discount, plus this guarantee that it won't lose value for a period of time makes this pretty attractive. So I would say, you know, take full advantage of it, especially since you've said this is doing well. And then as you're able to over time, perhaps you diversify away and, you know, buy other uh, holdings that would, you know, give you the, the diversification you need to be prudent in your investing strategy. But bottom line is, I think this is a great option, Amy, that you all should take full advantage of. Okay. Okay. Sounds great. Thank you so much. All right. We appreciate your call today. Uh, A lot of calls from Illinois. We're going to stay there. Matt is up next. Matt, how can I assist you? Um, So my wife has been granted uh, Social Security disability, and she is actually going to be getting a uh, check from when she was diagnosed. So I'm going to just do round numbers, approximately 40, maybe $50,000. Our home, uh, we owe approximately $62,000. And we have about $37,000 in auto loans between two vehicles. Would it be smarter to put a lump sum down on the house or the auto loans? My wife's other uh, idea is that she wants to do a room addition on the house. We do not have any credit cards. Okay, great. Uh, Do you have an emergency fund, Matt? No. Okay. Uh, you know, I'd probably start there and, you know, figure out what your monthly spend is. You know, what are your the total expenses that you have over a month's time? And I'd look to set aside three to six months. It's going to be really critical there to shore up your financial foundation for the unexpected. Uh, the other thing is, you know, I like the idea of you all paying cash for the addition rather than having to borrow more money down the road so you could hang on to this money for that purpose. But I'd probably consider waiting 
you know, unless this is something you guys are really looking to do in the very short term, you've got a family member moving in or something that uh, is requiring you to get a jump on this, you just may want to consider waiting, you know, perhaps up to a year and see if you can do a little better just in terms of the overall expense. But I think priority number one is shoring up that emergency fund. If you do have money left over to put toward debt, I'd prioritize the car loan first uh, over the house. Hope that helps you, Matt. We appreciate your call. Well, every day we talk about what the Bible has to say about money and how important it is to plan for how we manage it. If you haven't already done so, let me recommend that you check out the free FaithFi app and let it help you start on building a plan and working that plan so you control your money rather than it controlling you. You can find links to it on our website at faithfi.com. That's faithfi.com. I'm Rob West. Many thanks for listening today, and I hope you'll join us again next time right here on Faith and Finance. Faith and Finance is provided by FaithFi and listeners like you.